Um, good morning and welcome to everyone that is here for the Disruptive Innovation Festival with the Ellen McCarthy Foundation. We're here in Indianapolis, Indiana, and we brought invited a group of sustainability professionals together to talk about um, the, their activities involved in the circular economy here in the Midwest and Indiana. And we have people from all kinds of backgrounds here. We have people from renewable energy, uh, agriculture, renovation, um, and uh, hemp um, organization, manufacturing, and fiber, the fiber industry, um, and not-for-profits involved in the social aspect of the circular economy. So we are delighted that everyone is here. And what we're going to be doing is, this is the start of a conversation. Um, today is our panel, and we hope that this is a collaborative venture that continues on. Um, this is part one of our DIF um, event. The second part will be broadcast on November the 13th. It will be a live Q&A, so if you watch this part of our event, you'll have an opportunity to ask our panelists, um, most of whom will be available, um, to answer your questions. So without further ado, I would like to um, turn this over to Sylvia, the co-host. Um, thank you, thank you, Gwen, and thank you all for uh, coming and attending this uh, uh, important conversation that will help us uh, learn from each other what is happening on the ground in, uh, in the Midwest, uh, and also to share it with the global audience of the Disruptive Innovation Festival. We would like to uh, thank uh, our media sponsor and his team, uh, and their team, uh, Dan, Lance, and uh, David. Thank you very much for recording and editing and making us uh, look very good in front of the world. Uh, so if you, if you need uh, um, media work, uh, web design, Broad Ripple Unlimited uh, is uh, here for you. Um, so the agenda is uh, uh, the following. Uh, I'll do an introduction to the circular economy. If uh, I don't finish it, don't worry, uh, you'll get the presentation. Uh, it's just uh, for everybody to understand the common language of the circular economy, uh, which doesn't mean that we have to necessarily stick to it. There are many, many similar concepts, but I think this is one that is that is uh, catching up with a lot of uh, a lot of organizations, from corporations to small businesses, uh, from uh, nonprofits to farmers. So why not try to make it work in the Midwest? Um, then uh, we will introduce ourselves and uh, our work briefly, uh, and then the most important part: the conversation amongst ourselves on what we're already doing, what we want to do in the future, uh, and how we can create connections between us. Our ultimate goal is to make a live network, not only talk about it uh, and no, improve it theoretically, but make it work, and make it work not only for us, but for all the people of Indiana, the Midwest, USA, and the world. Um, so uh, we're not going to show you many pictures, and not at all the bad pictures. If anybody wants to see them, including uh, all over the world, just uh, come and walk through any uh, major industrial city, and not only in the United States. You can walk in the UK, you can walk in Europe, even in some of the up-and-coming industrial countries, there are already uh, abandoned uh, uh, places. But we want to start with uh, uh, a view of what the Rust Belt looks like, and this is Braddock, Pennsylvania, the small city where the steel industry started in the United States, um, and uh, a, a gentleman who does something about it, so it bringing it back from total abandonment. Uh, his name is John Fetterman, he is the mayor of Braddock, Pennsylvania, and uh, one of my uh, heroes. Our commitment is uh, 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 to sustainable communities. Uh, we want to find the best and faster solutions to all our social, environmental, and economic uh, problems. Um, 
we want to keep a promise to the people of the region. So if we're going to promote this extraordinary concept, we want to make sure that it really works for, for them and for everybody. Because we have experienced a lot of waves of changes that made extraordinary promises. And what happened, there were always more and more people uh, left uh, behind these changes. We don't want that to, to happen. Uh, in this instance. So if this is not the framework we should be looking at, then we need to look at something else. But for now, we believe it is. And there are already very good examples uh, in countries where it, uh, where it works. And you, you'll find a lot of information about countries that are already implementing at national level the concept of circular economy. But ultimately, we want a good life for uh, all, today and far into the future. So uh, we are also are not going to show you numbers. Uh, everybody can uh, find them, but just some numbers. So I was mentioning that all kind of changes and waves after the uh, 70s uh, uh, have, have happened. And what happened to the poverty <coughs> rates? They just went up. So it's not working. We need to do something else that includes everybody and again, doesn't leave anybody uh, behind. Uh, another example is we're not doing very well in Indiana on the uh, Human Development Index, which is much more comprehensive than GDP and other narrow economic uh, measures. Uh, so that's not a good position to be, but we can all, all, uh, only build up from here. Um, the, this will be a global exchange, the, the DIF festival of uh, knowledge, ideas, and experience in the circular econ on the circular economy uh, with our group in Indiana and the Mid Kentucky and the Midwest in general, and with the DIF uh, global uh, audience. Um, we really want to share uh, our work, experience, and success. So we're not going to dwell on what doesn't work, how many hurdles there are to make a change, what we're doing that already works, and we can uh, build upon. And uh, learn about innovative ideas and programs that would be replicated uh, in our region. Uh, so what is a circular economy? Um, according to the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, uh, which is uh, one of the strongest uh, proponents uh, uh, and organizations uh, on circular economy, so they do both uh, uh, conceptual work and practical work, business studies, education on the circular uh, economy. It is one that is restorative by design and which aims to keep products, components, and materials at their highest utility and value at all times, distinguishing between technical and biological cycles. Um, what does the circular economy aim for? To bring back human life and activities in balance with Earth's main cycles and finitude. We are consuming uh, above what the planet, we're consuming 1.5 planets uh, uh, every year, where the, uh, as the biologist said, the most invasive uh, species uh, ever. Definitely we're consuming much more than we need, and definitely we don't have uh, much more to consume. We live on a finite planet, there is no doubt about it, and while uh, uh, tinkering with going on Mars is cool, uh, I don't think we'll ever live there. Uh, so let's take care of uh, what we have. Um, we want the human-made world uh, because we will always create artifacts in balance with the natural world, where diversity, resilience, redundancy, smallness, interdependence, waste is food, slowness are the keys to survive and thrive. Um, so we want to change from the current linear model that uh, uh, is take, make, and waste, and at a faster and faster pace, uh, to a model that uh, wants to maintain as much as possible and everything, uh, then reuse, then remanufacture, and ultimately uh, recycle. Um, 
it is an industrial model, so it is a, a, an advanced, it's a model for an advanced uh, uh, economy. It's not a return to, to nature. Now I understand some people are considering that, but I don't think people will give up to the extraordinary technological achievements that uh, uh, we, uh, we have, uh, we use. However, we can make them such that they don't destroy uh, the planet. Uh, so it is managed their own circular flows of resources, products, processes that are renewable. That's a very important uh, thing. Long lasting life, high value, low carbon, low entropy, low waste, which is exactly how nature looks like. Um, nature except us because we are part of nature. Uh, Non-toxic, clean, nourishing, uh, and healthy. Uh, so how does this look at uh, a granular level uh, when you look at an entity that operates in the market? So that entity can be a manufacturer, can be a farmer, uh, an organization in general. Um, it, it operates on these two main cycles. The biological one means that you are going to try to return uh, with a benefic uh, um, uh, position uh, whatever you're wasting either in, in human biosphere or in the natural biosphere. So you're going to try to have feedstocks that can go into farming, whether it's uh, plant or animal farming. Um, such that they get recirculated and uh, they, uh, they're never toxic, they don't damage uh, nature or, uh, sorry, humans. Uh, then there are the technical cycles, so <coughs> everything that we create, uh, all the synthetic uh, uh, stuff that we create, and we do a lot of it, um, we need to try to keep them as close as possible to the user. And you notice that uh, uh, on the technical side, uh, a, new, a new word is being used, user, not consumer, and that is intentional because you're not supposed to consume, but to, to use something and then return it uh, through these uh, uh, loops. Um, I, and you, you want everything to be powered by renewable uh, energy, and uh, as much as possible, never go to the landfill. Now, uh, we, know, we all remember our thermodynamics. Everything degrades and you cannot keep it forever. But how about if you can keep it for 50 years in use instead of five minutes as a package? Um, we, it is a systemic solution, so it tries to, to uh, cover all the dimensions that sustainability is concerned about and uh, have a positive impact and optimal performance on society, environment, and economy. So none of the dimensions has priority, uh, and probably at least of all the, the uh, economy. So you have to find that common place that satisfies the need of a society, the need of uh, the environment <coughs> outside of humans, and uh, the need of uh, the economy. So thinking uh, um, in, in, uh, at, a, at a broader level, again, we must, we must find a way to reduce our activities such that we are not imbalancing the biogemical, uh, the geochemical and hydrological cycles, which is what has happened. Uh, in the last uh, 200, 300 years um, and reduce or eliminate all the energy and materials flows that are non-renewable, that are virgin, uh, toxic, socially bad, and increase uh, uh, the opposite. Um, the sun is there as a symbol for renewable energy because it is one of the greatest and uh, virtually free uh, source of uh, energy, but any form of renewable energy uh, is what we need uh, to use. Um, we think, uh, and this is why, why uh, we are all here to talk about the paramount, paramount objective is, again, not to leave anybody behind and to always think about people when we, we, we make this transformation. So the ultimate objective is societal welfare. 
where we know uh, the meaning that sometimes it's given to welfare. Look, welfare means well-being, happiness, uh, and nothing else. Uh, so again, it, this has to work for all the people. And, and in my view, uh, if it doesn't, they're not going to participate. And this has to be built by everybody collaborating and having a stake uh, in it. Uh, so again, if they don't see, if people don't see a benefit for them, they are not going to to work hard in making it happen. It will happen by formal and informal means. So this will not be a top-down. Uh, these are this is the checklist how to do it. It will be a lot of uh, uh, tinkering, and I really like that. Um, in fact, manufacturing and uh, Kyle knows about it. Uh, is transforming into more of an individual maker type. I can do all kind of stuff at home or in a little job shop. I don't need the enormous factories, which doesn't mean that we should let them rust. We should repurpose them. Um, but things are changing, so we shouldn't be scared that uh, uh, we nobody will be able to build cars. That's not true. There are, there are already small companies that build customers' uh, cars. Well, maybe they're not going to be millions of cars, but there will be enough, uh, just enough, just what we need. Um, we view it as bottom up and middle out, uh, that, uh, rather than top down, and with a very disruptive innovation attitude. No, I'm not going to believe the impossible. I'll try it and make it possible. And uh, you will see there are extraordinary things that can that are made, being made with materials that you would never think can be applied to that particular technology. Um, okay. Uh, or, or uh, buildings can be made to be like living gardens. So uh, everything, everything is possible. That's the attitude. Um, with system thinking uh, inspired by nature, weighing consequences. So we need to spend a lot of time before we build anything in thinking what the consequences will be. And first on the people, uh, and second on uh, the rest of the uh, uh, the world. Um, I will jump to another uh, uh, picture, which is the local view of the circular economy. So uh, my position is that this will not work if it doesn't work at local and regional level. Um, and that means that not only are you going to operate into your own market, you know, distributing your products uh, or services, but you're going to engage everybody around you um, into a local symbiosis. And this is also a very important concept that has been applied in some places very successfully for decades, where, uh, again, you create this ecosystem where nothing goes out. And if you have a company that creates a waste, you're going to find a company that can pick up that waste and make it a, a feedstock. Um, again, people are the most valuable resource to maintain and never waste. We need to use everybody's talent, skills, creativity, imagination. Everybody has capacity to do to, to work, to share, to collaborate towards universal aspirations. Um, and we think the circular economy will work if it provides resilient and prosperous local communities. So my view of the circular economy is all these small circles all over the world exchanging ideas, trading ideas and knowledge rather than stuff. Um, provides meaningful, fairly rewarded work at all skill levels, works for all people, abandons nothing and no one. Um, Another major purpose is, and again, it won't work if it doesn't deliver on, on uh, this goal, jobs at all skill levels. So yes, uh, not everybody needs to have a college degree. On the contrary, the people who repair need to have manual skills and will need them more and more. Um, we need uh, jobs that are uh, equitably rewarded, dignified, and uh, fair. Uh, no working poor uh, related to the first uh, 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 graph that I showed you. Uh, and a very important concept, uh, switch of taxation from work 
to non-renewable resources. And this is not my idea. It's being uh, discussed very seriously among the economists and uh, at the European Union level. Because you, you need to move, you need to move the financial incentives. Um, and uh, again, Walter Sahil, who has been working on this concept for uh, many decades, also mentions that uh, uh, we need to tax uh, uh, non-renewable resources, energy and materials, and no, no tax on renewable resources and work, human labor, is a renewable resource. Uh, and that would give activities uh, of the circular economy an immediate uh, incentive. Uh, and I'd like to end with a positive uh, uh, view of how we can uh, transform uh, the Rust Belt into a circular belt. And uh, uh, um, thanks to John's organization, this is where I picked uh, up the picture. Uh, this is the owner of big city farms in Indianapolis in front of a former factory, which is now an art center, uh, who took an abandoned uh, land. and. Uh, plants, vegetables, and made it green, uh, delivers to local restaurants, and every, everything functions, right? There is nothing ugly uh, in that uh, picture. Uh, so thank you, thank you very much. Sorry for going so uh, fast uh, through the presentation, uh, but uh, we'll answer questions during the discussion. Uh, we'll answer questions afterwards. Uh, and we can go more in that uh, on the circular economy and our future event. Uh, so now I would like to uh, ask uh, each of you to introduce yourselves uh, briefly, uh, tell us about your work and uh, your organization, uh, and then we will move into the discussion, which will be the most uh, interesting part of them all. So uh, would you like to start? I'm uh, Diyar Badisa. I'm with uh, Kepler Institute slash Keanu Media. Uh, we focus on community empowerment through self-mastery. We're focusing on youth development, social entrepreneurship, and urban agriculture. You said it all. I'm Emil Tapp, also with Adisa, also with uh, Kepler Institute. Uh, <coughs> presentation, of course, uh, uh, speaks to the importance of people first. And you know, I'm looking forward to some conversation around how do you do that, how do you improve on that. Uh, our work at uh, Kepler Institute is 35th Boulevard Place, very local focus, uh, and a primary emphasis on identifying the human resources that walk in the building, what are those talents and those skills, and how do we shape our organization and adjust and change our organization to utilize those skill sets and build capacity through that. I would like to add, you know, that at the end of the day, I think a lot of where we find ourselves is really a function of the challenge of climate change brought on by a dysfunctional global economy. And that uh, it's imperative, that we, whatever we call it, that it's imperative we figure out some other ways of interfacing and interacting with each other and the planet uh, if we plan to continue to, uh, to be on, on Earth. So, looking forward to some, some additional conversations. My name is John Gibson, and I am the statewide coordinator for Sustainable Indiana 2016, which is a bicentennial initiative of Earth Charter Indiana. And uh, our mission is to discover and document working sustainable models all across the state that we can celebrate as a bicentennial legacy. I'm Kelly Kepner, Benton County Economic Development Director, and um, Benton County has been known for the uh, first uh, uh, ones to have in the state of Indiana the wind farms uh, development, and it has definitely put us on the map in regards to recognition uh, in regards to the uh, wind turbines and renewable energy. Uh, through that, um, I have been doing a lot of guest speaking, um, working with a lot of the counties that are wanting to develop wind turbine uh, development in their area. And then I also was um, been very honored to uh, receive the Hoosier Hospitality Award uh, from Lieutenant Governor Sue Elsperman back last year. And that was because uh, I started at the Tourism Center in Benton County as well. And that has been going extremely well. We have. Um, 
in our county overall, we have 8,767 people and for the whole county. And um, since I started doing the tours, we have had over four, almost 5,000 people visiting Benton County. Uh, just to see the wind turbine uh, development and uh, we're actually expanding that with the kiosk and some more educational material for that. My name is Sean Van Diemeter. This is Elisa Owen. We're with EcoBridge Industries. We're actually uh, the uh, only, are we the only Kentucky company here today? So we're, we're, we're proud to be at the table in Indiana. Uh, we are a farm to factory company so we are working building circular economies in Kentucky around the supply and production of natural fibers that include hemp and also uh, canaf, which is our main focus right now, a little bit uh, less red tape uh, in the entry to the market. Uh, but to that point, uh, these fibers uh, are part of the materials revolution, uh, as Sylvia outlined in the circular economies presentation, uh, without the supply of these fibers coming from a local uh, uh, a community, it's impossible for manufacturers, designers, builders, etc., to utilize these fibers both environmentally and economically. The cost to ship these 7,000 miles from Southeast Asia uh, is exponential in addition to the fact that every 50,000 pounds, uh, I'm sorry, tons of these fibers that are shipped over here create about 20,000 tons of CO2 emitted in the atmosphere. So not only are we making it more cost effective for end buyers and end users, we're also making it more environmental. So you've heard of Farm to Table, which is the local food movement, we're Farm to Factory. And we understand that uh, one of the barriers to creating the circular economy in Kentucky and the Midwest is the actual supply and the production of the agricultural material. That's what EcoBridge does, uh, meanwhile working with existing industries, existing manufacturers to vertically integrate our fibers into their products. I would add for us simply that when we talk about the um, circular economy, if you don't have the bookend of the supply chain, which is the raw material, which is what we grow, then you cannot have the rest of the links of the supply chain, which involve the people, which involve the communities, which brings the manufacturing home to the local loop. And so you get a, an economy that's responsible to its people in its immediate environs. And when you do that, you improve welfare for human beings. So yes, we're growing canaf, but we're also bringing jobs home and bringing work home and bringing dignity home. And that to us is extremely important. And I'm Gwen White. Um, I come from a sustainability reporting background and actually an accounting background. But my main focus is to get organizations to report about their progress their impacts, economic, environmental, social, and um, I like uh, listening to every all these perspectives and I think there's a place for everyone to report their progress. So that's my focus. I'm Kyle Squillis with Impressive Prototypes and we are a local uh, to Indianapolis uh, job shop, uh, model shop, uh, serving manufacturers, startups, inventors, uh, people that need things made physically. Uh, so we are the makers, we are the craftsmen, uh, the engineers, designers, that, uh, and sometimes artists that, that bring new concepts and ideas to life. And we were born out of a, a larger corporate business uh, that left the area, um, lost several jobs, lost many jobs, and we were able to, to bring on some of those key uh, players and, and maintain those skill sets and <coughs> in addition to expanding those and hire new employees as an independent shop out of the corporate shadow. So we've been, been around in our 10th year now and we've been serving local, regional, national companies, uh, consumer product industry, uh, automotive, um, medical, as I mentioned, inventors. Um, happy to be here today. Uh, thank you for the time. I'm Duncan Campbell. I'm recently retired architecture faculty from Paul State. Um, I, my specialty is historic preservation, and I ran the graduate program in historic preservation at Ball State for several years. Before that, I was a consultant working with private developers to restore historic buildings. And uh, before that, I was a carpenter and a contractor. So I've really seen all sides of the field, from the academic to the driving of nails. Um, and most recently in my retirement, I've, I've become very interested in 
the sustainable aspects of historic preservation and the not so sustainable aspects, I have to admit. Um, but, but moreover, I've been convinced that rather than talking about buildings that have uh, their historic integrity or historic importance to the culture or benefit the public welfare because of their the history and the story they tell, really all buildings are important when you start to talk about sustainability. And you can't really afford to tear down any buildings. And I'm talking about the garage behind your house that doesn't have a good roof on it anymore, all the way to the newest, greenest, hottest stuff. I got interested in this because as an architecture faculty, I came up against, as a preservationist, I came up against the green builders. And I, and I quickly realized that the green builders were ignoring my end of the field. Um, and so I started doing research into the, the sustainable benefits of adaptively reusing buildings. And the presentation I'll talk about today has to do with that aspect of, of uh, keeping our built environment intact. Thank you. Hi, I'm Taylor Glover. I'm the Vice President of Indiana Hip Industries Association. Uh, what we do is promote the uses and educate um, about industrial hemp, uh, the cannabis plant. Um, it's been tough in Indiana because we are such a conservative state and the long-held opinions um, and about, about hemp uh, are tough to get through. Um, so the prohibition of hemp has lasted a very long time and I consider this issue um, a lot of, it's an environmental issue, uh, it's a social justice is issue. Um, that's really why I got involved um, with it in the first place because I believe it really is an injustice to um, withhold hemp from the American, from American citizens, from farmers, um, because it's, it's an incredibly valuable resource um, environmentally uh, for food, for fiber, for fuel, uh, for many things that people don't realize that, um, that it can be used for. So my job is to um, explain those as best I can and try to paint a different picture of this crop and agricultural commodity that has gotten a bad name in the past 70 or so years. Uh, my name is Silga Lacroix. I live in Indianapolis. Uh, I'm a sustainable manufacturing uh, consultant and circular economy, but my background is in manufacturing. Uh, I don't understand why we demolished <laughs> it uh, here, and not only here, I'm very sad about that, but uh, like the mayor in Braddock, I'm not taking it uh, down. I do everything. Yes, we need to return all jobs uh, uh, locally. Um, and uh, not all jobs uh, are, are equal, uh, including at the uh, skill level. And also, since we're talking about maintenance, and Kyle already mentioned it, uh, I think it's very important to maintain skills. And the more sophisticated, yeah, we're talking about farming skills, right? So from when hemp was mandatory to plant, then it was forbidden. You have lost that know-how. And it's very costly to recover it. The same way it's costly to repair a very damaged building. It's even more important for skills, all skills. So is there still tailoring in America? No. Why is that? And is it easy to restore it? No, it's very costly. Um, what, do we all, what do we offer to the young generations? Why would they go into manufacturing? There is nothing there. Why would they learn math, uh, physics, uh, manual labor, since there is nothing uh, there? Or even if they get a job for a while, then they disappear. I'm against that. Uh, um, at the, and we need to manufacture things close to the uh, users uh, and consumers. So manufacturer will not move from here, they are looking for the lowest cost place, but it will flourish everywhere. And again, we will exchange know-how uh, and innovation uh, and creativity, uh, not stuff. And in my view, this will help on the climate change because we will reduce the demand for stuff, right? You're going to serve 
the clear needs of your, your region. You don't need to bring tons of stuff and then try to sell them uh, into, into the market or create very a lot of cheap stuff because once you bring them from afar, you need to have enormous volumes uh, to, to bring. So it, whichever uh, aspect we're looking at, it is essential that we make our stuff, not only in manufacturing, in farming, and I'm really very interested in the connection between farming and manufacture, where manufacturers, before they look at any synthetic material or request for a new material to be created, they should look at the natural material, and they should look at what farmers in their region can provide uh, for them. Um, and uh, I want to thank you again for participating into our event. So let's open uh, up our uh, conversation. Uh, uh, Imamata, would you like to start and give us some uh, examples of the work that you do in uh, the Indianapolis community? Uh, I guess I'd like to start with why do we do it? And what do we do? Uh, we work, live, play in a family African American community. I was born and raised here in Indianapolis. And uh, the community we work with in now has high poverty rate, high employment rate, uh, high crime rate. So there are a lot of perceived challenges as released as it at least as it relates to what we call often consider economic capital. Uh, but there's a lot of social capital in our communities. And it's often not looked at, it's often not measured, it's often not considered, and it's often not built. So most of our work is centered around how do we create an environment that encourages and builds social capital. And so if you come into our center on any given day, you might find somebody there that's an expert at cooking. Uh, there's an expert at sewing. Um, some of these folks have never had W-2. Some have gone to college. But we create a space that says, okay, how do we utilize that synergy, synergy, that energy to build community? And it's our belief that, that people ultimately want to be able to give something to the community itself, even more so than just receiving a paycheck. So a lot of our work is driven through that lens. All of our work is driven through youth development. So all of this intergenerational ages, eight years old to 87 year olds, on any given day, probably 15 to 20 people coming out of our center daily. Uh, we provide food daily, a meal every day, focused on healthy foods, uh, and it's cooked right there by some member of our community. Uh, yesterday we had a potato bar. It was just an open potato bar. Whoever came in, came in and ate, used the internet, worked, and had conversations. So really about building community through what we call the new model. So one of the specific projects that, that we work with as it relates to the circular, the circular, the circular economy approach. The, I mentioned one, KI New Media, which is a youth-led, intergenerational social enterprises that builds websites, videography, uh, social media, graphic design. Uh, this group of young folks 23 to 29 years old. Some are college trained, parent graduates. Others have learned right there in the center. They in turn are training another group of teenagers in those same skill sets. And they then go out and on the video side, for example, and capture stories from the community and, uh, and organizations. And again, trying to demonstrate what are the possibilities in community with the resources that are right there in your community. So trying to recapture a sense of self-reliance, self-determination, and utilizing those resources that already exist uh, right there in front of you. So that's one project. We have one, the, another project, what I call the sexy of the food movement is John saying that the aquaponics operation, in fact, John's organization helped support that initiative. And that's uh, an operation where you raise fish, and plants in a closed loop system indoor. Uh, it's about 3,000, I think it's 3,000 gallons of water in the existing system. It was helped build and designed by a 10 year old who was uh, one summer project 
his job was to learn everything about aquaponics. So his research project for the summer was what is aquaponics, what are the types of systems that you can use to build it. And so after the summer project within us, they said, okay, we're going to build this thing. And we took the next two to three years and built this aquaponic system. Uh, our facility currently is inside a building called the Renaissance Center. It was fairly close to being empty. Uh, it's an old nursing home owned by a church in the community. The church is 150 years old. They wanted a, an outreach program to community and youth that did not have a direct connection to the church. So they didn't want it to be dominated by the church's voice, but there was a give back, back, back to it. So when we moved into that space, um, it was in some sense part of the same concept of re reuse from a space that was already there. The church had a community vision. We had a vision in relation to working with young people. And we found a way to collaborate and make that particular initiative uh, function. Um, any other enterprises I want to mention? Certainly, anything else? Well, there's something that uh, Duncan can help you with. Do you know about uh, this project? Well, actually, on uh, well, Duncan, I do want to talk more about about that offsite. I'll share what the thing that came to my mind was. We're involved with uh, a couple of uh, quality of life plans in the city of Indianapolis. And in one of the communities we work in, the one Diop lives in, over 40% of the properties are vacant or abandoned. The city is being challenged by what do we do with these properties? Of course, demolition is, is one of those, those concepts. There's some discussion about uh, deconstruction, which we used to do another initiative we did years ago, where you take these properties and you you recycle the properties to reuse for some other things. So we're in conversations with those folks at the city level about, in addition to uh, how to reuse these properties, how to, to do some things on the line. So I would like to hear more about because the big pushback is what you said. Is it is it economically efficient on the current model to rehab those properties, or is it just simply easier to tear them down, put that stuff in the landfill, and, and start anew? And there are, there are structural challenges uh, uh, for incentives for developers to consider other models. So I will welcome the opportunity to have more conversation about that as, as we continue this discourse. But for us, it's, we believe that the, the social capital is the element that is, is often <coughs> left out of the conversation. So if we can find ways to look at that and identify that, uh, and make that more of the, the dominant narrative, I think this transition to a circular economy may move faster. We're working with IEPUI also on an urban farming project in the same neighborhood, and one of the, the pieces of the, the grant that they've received is creating a tool that will allow you to measure social capital increase through these relationships, uh, and, and through that maybe provide, quote unquote, evidence to say, Emphasis on social capital is a viable, legitimate uh, aspect of, of the work. And lastly, I'll say cultural capital is critical also. That the work, we all have different ways in which we communicate, interface with each other, and it's often undervalued. And it, with this new circle economy model, if, if that's the language folks embrace, uh, the challenge of race, class, and gender isms have to be addressed. Because if, they, if they're not, then people who live in the communities that we live in, you know, we have fear, well, we're gonna create a new economy. Will we be left out of that new economy? Is this just being driven by the fact that income inequality for all folks, black folks and white folks is on the rise, and that this new, this new initiative to bring about change is really more out of, out of your own community self-interest and not out of the, the interest of, of all. Lastly, we have a gentleman who comes to our center, you may know him, I forget his name, He's been hosting meetings also around how to utilize him uh, industrially. So I like to get to these numbers too. So that's my take. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, well, I'm not as eloquent as them with that. Um, and I can't uh, probably keep my thoughts together quite that well. But I'll tell you a little bit about my history. In the year 2000, after running for mayor of Indianapolis and being completely exhausted, <laughs> and getting kind of old and having spent a lifetime in activism, I said, 
what am I going to do with the rest of my life? I went to New York where there was a conference because as you know, this was the transition to the, to the new millennium. Went to a conference in New York where they were talking about imagining uh, America in the 21st century. And, and there I became acquainted with a brand new document called the Earth Charter. Now we didn't call it a circular economy document. It was called a sustainable development um, approach. Totally holistic, inclusive, comprehensive, and, and I fell in love with it because I had been working up to that point in all areas of, of spirituality, of environment, social and economic justice, democracy, nonviolence, and peacemaking. And I was trying to decide, now which one of these do I need to choose for the rest of my life? But when I saw the Earth Charter, I thought, I don't have to choose because they all fit together. And in fact, they must be interdependently considered which is a good circular economy concept. I'm finding out. This is a new term for me, but I'm falling in love with it too, especially your, your description of it, uh, <clears throat> Sylvia. So um, I came back from that conference and called together some of my friends, and we said, what do you think about this Earth Charter? You think it could add some value to what we've been doing in Indiana for a long time? And they all agreed it would. So we developed a not-for-profit organization around it. And then in 2006, we sort of began to wonder, how do we infuse or embed this way of thinking in our Hoosier state? Um, because the, the, the normal perception of Indiana is that it is very conservative, stodgy, um, unprogressive, and uh, probably uh, not going to lead in anything. And seems to be somewhat satisfied with that reputation. Uh, so this is a challenge to, uh, to create this transformative idea, which is what the circular economy is. So, bingo, we thought, okay, in 2016, Indiana is going to celebrate its 200th birthday, bicentennial. So we said, let's see what we can do to leverage that, that event with some ideas and some models that will take us into the future so that our bicentennial is not simply a review of our history, but it is anticipation of our future. Okay, so this was in 2006, and we created this program as a bicentennial initiative called Sustainable Indiana 2016. Now, in the beginning, I didn't know quite what to do with this. So I went on the internet and typed in sustainability in Indiana. I didn't know if anything would come up, but sure enough, there were some things that came up. There was a couple things down in Evansville, for example. There was a, uh, uh, a small farm that had been converted from corn and beans uh, uh, to uh, sustainable agriculture in Clay County. There was a, a business in Indianapolis that had a triple bottom line. So I was encouraged. And so right away, I thought, okay, now there's a strategy. Um, let's see if we can identify working models, Hoosier-based, uh, that people can look at and say, you know, I could do that too. So that these things then become uh, <clears throat> the foundation for building on a sustainable uh, society in our beloved Indiana. <coughs> uh, now, in the beginning, we had to to, to look around to find these things. They were there, but they were not well known, except by a very small circle. Uh, maybe it's the LEED certified building. Maybe it's uh, 
a community garden. Maybe it's a small farm converted to um, uh, organic agriculture. Uh, and we began to uh, document these put them on our website, kind of a catalog we uh, create. Well then, as time goes on, these, these models began to emerge faster. I mean, uh, I would talk to somebody and they say, have you heard of this? Go there and talk to them. That then led to another. It's kind of like following your nose. And that's exactly what we have been doing. And now, after we've documented 200 of these models, at over 20 communities, uh, which we call uh, uh, Green Legacy uh, Communities, because they encompass a mix of these sustainable practices. Uh, after that, uh, we can't keep up with it anymore. Uh, it's like um, I've got right now uh, a whole uh, class of kids in a in a uh, at IPFW in Fort Wayne that are, are, are going off across the city of, of, uh, of Fort Wayne in Allen County and they are doing interviews, taking pictures, and they're going to write photo essays on probably nine or ten projects because I don't have the staff to do that. I've got the same thing happening down in Bloomington with uh, interns at IU. Uh, they're fanning out around Bloomington and they're doing the same thing. And then people call and say, okay, you gave us some ideas of what we could do, but here's an another one. Have you been to Blackford County? It's the smallest county in the state, you know. So what I'm trying to illustrate here in my, in my short introduction is, surprisingly, surprisingly, we are discovering that even though Indiana is conservative, there are uh, an amazing number of people who are progressing and who are just out there doing the deed, um, demonstrating that this does work, and finding the benefits of living in this new paradigm. You call it circular economy, sustainable, green, climate solutions, or whatever. It all kind of adds up to about the same, the same thing. And <clears throat> I could give a number of illustrations. I hope that Duncan will talk a little bit about what's happening in Muncie. <clears throat> uh, there's some some very interesting things happen there, whether it's Goshen or whether it's uh, uh, Scottsburg or uh, Terre Haute or, I mean, it's everywhere in the state. Elements of the circular economy are in fact taking root and I think are going to uh, usher in a, a, a new day. Now, I am a call attention to the urgency of climate change. Uh, I'm, I'm with you there 100%. And, 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 the, and the only question in, in my mind is can we make this conversion, this transition to a, a circular economy or to what I would call a sustainable economy can we make this in time to prevent the most catastrophic consequences of our misappropriation of the planet? Uh, but that's, that's our challenge. Uh, I'm still cautiously optimistic we can do it. And when I meet with a group of people like this, most of whom I have not met before, I say to myself, this is worth giving up tomorrow morning and keeping at it. Well, Kelly, can you tell us about uh, 
wind farms in a coal-based state. Okay, well, um, Benton County, as I mentioned earlier in my introduction, uh, we are a very small community um, county of only 8,767 people for the whole county. And we actually rate 89th of the 92 counties for smallest population. And so when I would go as director, go into the IEDA meetings and different things, they kind of look at me like, Benton County, where's that? Well, once we ended up becoming known for our wind turbines, uh, the wind farm development, it has just blossomed. It has done a remarkable job of putting us basically on the map uh, in the, out there with the uh, marketing for renewable energy and promotion of all that. We um, were the first farm for the, to have the development in the state of Indiana, which I, we take a lot of pride in that. Um, we are uh, very, uh, Strong and what we what I like about it the most is when you talk about the circular economy, how we're getting the multiple use of the land. You know, we are we are very big in agriculture, and so our soil is very uh, dear to us, and we're not going to use it for anything but developing <coughs> our uh, corn and soybean uh, production. However, when we brought the wind tur turbines in, um, it was just like not much land being used in order to have them. Um, you start to have that trickling effect that we have starting to see uh, when we brought the wind farms in. We had the, first of all, it really helped with our taxes as a county. Um, we have so far as of 2014 over two million dollars uh, brought in for taxes because of the development of the wind farms. We have um, multiple use of the land as I mentioned. We have the landowners then are getting uh, money for the lease of the ground. Then you had um, the communities getting involved um, by, through the developers wanting to help contribute to them and, and help support the communities. So we had a, a new building uh, for our county government uh, was built. Uh, we were able to, uh, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, Little Leagues, you know, all those type of things were um, uh, helped out in a lot of ways financially. We also, for many years, have been known now for our uh, 4th of July festival because of the fireworks that BP was so willing to donate towards. Uh, we've had people from out of the uh, state even come over to the, see the uh, fireworks display. Then we have uh, purchase of emergency <coughs> equipment was made for the county, so we are, uh, that was helped out with our fire departments. We had um, huge money uh, uh, amount just deposited to our schools. Uh, through the, we had like two million dollars that was deposited in schools and there's support for that. And then we had um, a lot of our small towns uh, were starting to feel the recession, you know, and when we had that going on. We had um, over 760 workers during the first development of the wind farms back in 2007 and 8. And so we did not actually feel the recession until 2010. So um, because of that, that was a huge impact in keeping our smaller businesses um, open and, and uh, vital and during that time. Our uh, county commissioners decide that's how I ended up getting my job as full-time director. We had an economic development director uh, that was part-time and then because of the money that was coming in, we were able to, they started seeing the, the need for a full-time and that's how I uh, got my position. And then through the development of the wind farms, we ended up uh, another trickling effect was we saw the need for education. So we went ahead and developed work with Ivy Tech and now Ivy Tech offers a very good two-year um, certification that you can get in the renewable energy. And what is really neat about that I like uh, because of my background being in education that we are now bringing back the kids that are graduating from high school not having to leave, they are actually just going down the road to, you know, to Lafayette to do the IV Tech training and then being able to have jobs and come back to the, uh, and make good money. Um, they are very good jobs. And so then it's also given them opportunity to travel with the job as well. So it's a very unique and special opportunity for our communities in regards to the education, the local businesses, the residents, uh, the landowners, and then and the residents, mainly because of the taxes, how it's really helped us out. We were in debt due to a uh, jail that we uh, expanded and built and re redid. 
So it really hurt us uh, financially. And then when the wind farms came in, uh, we were actually clear of debt after the first payment of the uh, t taxes that they had to pay. So in regards to the circular economy, it was a huge impact in regards to see how that affect every section um, of the trickling effect of the economy. The one thing that I am very proud of, um, because of that, we went ahead and saw the need for tourism. Um, I had a lot of calls coming in asking me, hey, can, can you show us around? Is there any, what can we do to get more information about the wind farm tours? And so um, doing the entrepreneur thing and working with other businesses, I thought, heck, I have the opportunity to be an entrepreneur here. So I asked the county commissioners and I said, what do you think about the county getting involved in tourism? <coughs> and they just kind of looked at me and said, doesn't cost us anything, go ahead and go for it. So I went ahead and developed um, I hired a gentleman that is a retired teacher, and he uh, works with me. I uh, take all the calls. I'm responsible for the money and making the reservations for the tour and everything and setting up the, the time with the, business, uh, with the building. And then he gives the tour. And we have grown. Uh, we started out in 2000, May of 2010. And like I said earlier, we are now uh, have almost close to 5,000 visitors that have come through uh, our county because of the tourism center. We just this year had a group from Hawaii, a busload of 52 people come from Hawaii to come and see it. I had a group from um, homeschooled uh, parents that wanted to have their kids get the opportunity to have an educational uh, presentation of the wind farm <coughs> called, called me specifically from the state of Washington that flew into our area just for that, but then I guided them, okay, this is what else you can come and see and, and do the tourism for. So I see a huge, um, with my educational background, it, I really enjoy that part of the tourism side of, and that's why we are developing a kiosk right now. I have the developers, um, wood developers donating some money uh, to uh, create a kiosk that's gonna be a replica of an actual wind turbine. So you're gonna walk down a pathway that would be the column, and then on the end you have information of all four developers. Our four developers are Orion Energy, uh, BP, and then Anexco and Pattern Energy was the last one that is right now in production. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you have known about it. It's with the Amazon.com uh, and their web services that they're using a lot of the energy and, and working with that. So we, um, a lot of people that mistake, they think, okay, oh, you must be getting really cheap utilities uh, for energy, and that's actually not true. We have to pay just the same as everybody else, but those. The development is going on the grid and going to the markets that, and it is used in Indiana. <coughs> so uh, Indianapolis Power and Light are using it, and Vectron is also another oh, company that is using it. Pardon? I am one. Very good. Yes, and so it's it's great to see that we small town, you know, community of Cotton County, Benton County, is actually being a part in the renewable energy source, and so we take a lot of pride in that. So we're welcoming any new uh, renewable energy companies if you'd like to come in um, especially with the solar we'd like to expand out and see what else we can be doing with things so uh, it's been a great great ride for the last six years especially uh, working with the tourism side and the renewable energy one, one remark that i would like to make that it is good that we are in a challenging place that that's my view because if we make it work here then it's very easily transferable in places that are already open to it. So, and again, it has to work for everybody. And we lost a lot, so we're coming from a, from a difficult situation, uh, which is even more important to make this work, uh, so that, again, it will provide a model for other uh, communities. So it feels uh, very good. Every, uh, if anybody hasn't seen the turbine, it's very emotional to pass by them on I-65. I've always stopped and greet them. And it's only at night. And it is impressive. Again, we are in a coal-based state. And look what we can do. Uh, so again, everything is possible, not, uh, not impossible. Uh, now tell us about the great uh, Louisville, Kentucky. Sure, so in the interest of fostering some bit of discussion, I have some questions for you as it relates to the policy that was in place before the turbines came in, as opposed to potential policy that may derive from their installation. 
we're from Kentucky and we can uh, flip a coin for who's more conservative uh, in terms of politically <laughs> and policy. But to that point in Kentucky, it is actually illegal to generate our power off anything but coal because of the price point that's mandated, which is nine cents a kilowatt hour. So to that point, the original conceptualization of the wind turbines, was that a government project? Was that a public project, a public-private partnership? And if so, were there any hurdles in uh, state energy policy that you had to combat to even get the project up and running? No, we actually had um, the development, the first development started before I was in, in my position as economic development director. So um, I, but I was working at the extension office as a program manager, so I was a little bit involved with learning more about the development. Um, basically, what the county just saw that they wanted to find a way to bring in more revenue into the community and it was very well accepted. Um, we did have, we did go to Iowa and Illinois to look at their ordinances and stuff for um, decommissioning and that type of thing for construction, but uh, there was really no issues that I'm aware of. Um, the Indiana, um, we, I mean, it'd be nice if we had a renewal package uh, to be working with, but until then, you know, it's, we didn't see, I haven't, I was not aware of any. Well, the reason I ask is I feel like uh, for companies like ours, and since we are talking about uh, disruptive innovation, uh, we've seen more, uh, shall we say, results or measurable results in just doing what we do as opposed to waiting on governments to endorse us or waiting on other stakeholders in the community to endorse us, which kind of goes back to your point, uh, John, you went to New York and, and you saw a concept that you felt could be replicated here. You know, Kanaf and hemp are by no means new. And to the extent uh, that Indiana is conservative uh, and potentially uh, fearful of uh, hemp, it's the complete opposite in Kentucky because it is a native crop in Kentucky. But to that point, it has been uh, exponentially regulated for over 70 years. And it was in fact the Kentucky Commissioner of Agriculture who went to DC to push this through in the 2014 Farm Bill. Um, to that point, we still have a culture, and this goes back to your cultural uh, collateral or you know, uh, capital, if you will. Uh, we have a politically coal skewed cultural capital in Kentucky and likely in Indiana. But to the extent that uh, the only way you get um, true progress in a state that's not progressive is to do it. Just go do it. Um, you know, I started down the path of natural fibers four and a half years ago, and full disclosure, I left being a contract lobbyist to do what I'm doing. Um, because once you see the sausage made, you can better navigate uh, that process, if you will. To that point, you know, it, it even took Elisa a couple of uh, years, for lack of a better word, to really see that the proof is in the pudding. And for us, uh, it wasn't a uh, case of, oh, we have this great idea and it can do this, this, and this. The state didn't care to hear about how many jobs we'll eventually create. They don't care about the environmental impact, uh, but we're doing it and we're gaining support all over the country, all over the world, because we just took that initiative to do it like you did with the Earth Charter, like you all did or the church did with creating your center. Um, so oftentimes it comes, in my opinion, you know, this collaboration here is much more valuable, uh, especially us being uh, from another state, to come to the table and hear the actual proof that you all have from what you've done. I know Taylor uh, closely uh, because we're in the same industry, uh, Sylvia as well, um, and they'll both tell you that until you actually get out and educate people on what you're doing and set the standard for what is uh, applicable or available or feasible, uh, it's the same cycle and it's the same per perpetuation. Um, back to the political point in Kentucky, Every elected uh, statewide leadership official, whether it's the governor, the attorney general, uh, the speaker of the house, or the president of the senate, are all from coal counties. And so there's strong incentive in a coal severance fund to send those tax dollars back to those coal counties to do development. However, they're not creating development that replaces the jobs in the mines. They're not creating development that cleans up the messes the mines have made. They're building schools and roads that go to nowhere, and the population there is forced to leave, which you know is driving them to Lexington and Louisville. Uh, to your point, in Portland neighborhood in Louisville, which is the oldest neighborhood in Louisville, uh, and it used to be the largest hemp port in the United States because it's right on the Ohio River, there are 1,400 vacant and abandoned properties. So that's a problem that every, every state has, every city has, and arguably every country has. 
And so part of what EcoBridge is trying to do is we're going to create smaller circular economies across the state, whether it's in the coal mines of eastern Kentucky, whether it's in West Louisville, around the utilization of our fibers. And so, for instance, right now we're on a 100-acre commercial scale grow in western Kentucky. Well, Haynes and Fruit of the Loon used to have their global headquarters there. So there are large factories. There's an extensive amount of machinery that's available, and it just needs to be retooled. You have the workforce in place. So actually going through an exercise for us across the state and identifying what industry existed there, uh, how can we integrate into these, you know, these fibers into those existing industries or those run-down industries? And, and the answer is simple. If you build it, they will come. That's a terrible cliche. Nobody wants to hear about. Nobody wants to bank on that. No investors can be like, okay, yeah, that's great. But it's true. Us putting in the 100 acres of Kanaf in Kentucky, uh, you know, our farmers look at as crazy, but they also see it as an opportunity. And farmers are very, very fast learners. Most people think farmer, dumb, redneck, whatever. That is completely not true. Not true. Uh, and so if you present and create an opportunity for any industry, whether it's agriculture, manufacturing, um, you know, alternative energy, if you just create it and put it out there and take the risk as an entrepreneur or as a change maker or as a, you know, uh, act, you know, activist, people will be responsive. And that's why you found more than you thought you would find across the state because people are taking that initiative to do it and they don't need somebody waving a flag and giving them a trophy for participation, et cetera, et cetera. They're just doing what they believe in. So the power in that is bringing them all to the table like you're doing, and I commend you for that. The most, the way that I would describe the current economy in a, as opposed to what we're trying to, to make happen, uh, I think nobody has described it better than Octavio Paz. Uh, when he was accepting the Nobel Prize for Literature. He, I, I will never forget this. He said, nothing was as sad as the day that he looked at the soldiers coming home from World War II on the television and saw that life was happening elsewhere than in Mexico. Nobody wants their life outsourced. And when we don't have a circular economy, we're outsourcing people's lives. We're outsourcing the lives of people in your neighborhood. And when we do that, what we say is, you don't matter. And if we bring production back home, like we're trying to do, then we say, there's something here for you to touch and see and taste and smell. There's something in Pitton County to come and see there's a place for tourists to come. It's not just one more cornfield in flat Indiana. Wow. What I was thinking is one of the exciting people for me to meet was Kyle, who does prototypes. And one of the things that I thought is for EcoBridge, one of the exciting things for me in working with Canap Face Fiber is that the world is going to make the change from a petroleum-based plastic to plant-based plastic. Right now, only 1% of the global market is plant-based plastic. But it's going to make the change. And so we might need somebody to help us figure out how to make prototypes of products out of plant-based plastic. So when I was thinking about that, listening to all of you all speak, I was like, wow, it's so exciting to be doing something that might end up in a prototype. Well, guess what? They've got people who are doing websites that might end up with a prototype. John is telling stories about people that are doing a prototype, right? A, a, an original thing. They're doing an original thing in their county. The circular economy is leading where you are and saying, I'm not outsourcing my life. I'm not outsourcing it to Bangladesh. And I don't want the Bangladeshis to outsource their stuff to me. I want everybody to be involved in a way that makes them feel important. So Elisa and Sean will build a nest kind of uh, Corvette. That's the plan. <laughs> <laughs> so, by the way, you can do it. Kyle will grow it and Kyle will build yes, it. Kyle will build it. Right. Answer that point. That, that's a point of clarification on Sylvia's point, and Taylor knows this. Henry Ford's original Model T was patented off hemp plastic and was made to run off hemp fuel. 
Most people don't know that because it's not in our education system. So again, going out and doing your own education or your own research, you'll learn a lot more. And you know, originally uh, in the 30s, 40s, 40s and 50s, the whole uh, circle economy of the African American community was to keep the dollar in the community because the dollar that stays in the community gets spent in the community four times before it leaves the community. And so these are not new concepts whatsoever. It's just about the matter of how we share the information, which, you know, thank you, Sylvia, for putting this together. Uh, yeah, so just a little bit more about uh, impressive prototypes. I mentioned we, we came from uh, being an internal shop at a large corporate uh, manufacturer, consumer electronics base, and uh, a, lot of those, a lot of those jobs were sent overseas once uh, the TV business, you know, there, there was no margin in it. Um, there still isn't. Um, it's and a tough historic brand. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's a historic brand for India. Right. Yeah, the RCA dome. It was you know, RCA Thompson Consumer Electronics. So, so it's kind of a feel-good stories that we're able to save, um, you know, half a dozen or so jobs, um, and to bring them into the same business, but serving a, a much wider clientele, not just making TVs or remote control set-top boxes, your direct TV box at home, for example. Um, so now we, we, we make um, not only prototypes but end products. So we've got in, gotten into custom furniture, um, and, and it's usually people that are local that are looking for a workshop, that are looking for expertise, resources, the, the, the machinery. Not everyone has all the woodworking equipment or the painting and finishing booth that you need to, to make something you know um, you know really uh, robust and something to be proud of. So. So that's kind of where we've made our mark is to to be the place locally or one of the places that people know that um, if you need something on the pre-production level, and, you know, if, it, if it's going to be two or three years out before it's going to go into mass market, that we can make a physical item for you um, based on your your CAD drawing, based on your napkin scale, <coughs> um, and sometimes it's just an idea and there isn't much on paper uh, or on the screen. So so we've been able to you know harness the the, the guys that have had 20, 30 years that have been second generation model makers that, that didn't just go into early retirement, they've, they've um, expanded their skills and, and over the last decade have, have passed those on to um, another group of people that have come in like myself <coughs> um, as an engineer that have not seen the model making kind of craftsman um, skill set that used to be at every manufacturer in the states and now a lot of it's outsourced, um, a lot of it is uh, uh, has, you know, it's, it's kind of a lost art in a lot of ways. So, um, so we again, we've tried to, you know, there's some, some new technologies uh, such as 3D printing um, that people probably have heard of or are somewhat familiar with. Additive manufacturing is another term. Um, so we, it's a very good option for people that, uh, that need something that doesn't cost thousands and thousands of dollars like it used to, that we can 3D print overnight. Um, whereas it used to take you know weeks or months and a lot of capital and a lot of uh, a lot of people looking at it uh, to, to produce the same thing, so it's it's really um, Sylvia mentioned that the maker movement it's definitely um, a movement that isn't going to go away. It's it's popping up everywhere in cities across the across the country. Maker spaces, and so we're we're kind of the original you know maker space, but on the on the pro level, I guess you could say so. Um, it, around Indianapolis, I know there um, there's a group called uh, Ruckus that's getting ready to launch in the Riley area, um, where they're going to have um, craftsmen and, and metal workers and artists and designers all under the same roof to to live in close proximity and to share each other's resources and, and we're looking to be a big part of that as well um, to to lend our expertise. So, um, but, but back to 3D printing, um, that whole movement is is really grown and. And, um, and we have a couple 3D printers in house. We have a, a local network of people that, that have additional uh, resources because you can't. It's tough to have every capability under one roof on a on a prototype level or a low volume level. So um, you know it's 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 constantly pushing the envelope. There's new materials that are being used that are that are um, renewable. And people are recycling filament that um, every time a part is made, um, it's it's much more efficient than. Then milling a block of wood or a block of steel um, as subtractive manufacturing. This is basically building, um, building something from nothing, from a building a spool or a, a bottle of resin. 
um, but there's always excess material. So uh, students out on the West Coast have come up with a way to recycle that material that was support and not critical to the model and to reuse it again on the printer uh, and then to you know, make money by selling that spool of material. So there's, there's material, PLA, corn-based material, it's very popular with the printer. So not just the energy savings over traditional manufacturing um, where there's very little waste in printing, but, um, but the materials themselves are becoming more friendly and, and I'm excited to learn about ways we can get a filament of, uh, of a Kanaf as soon as possible and try it out and, awesome. and uh, you know, see what happens. So, so it's exciting. Um, and again, we're, we're, we're trying to um, you know, repurpose and reuse as many things as we can. We, we build you know, refrigerators, we, we build car interiors. Rarely are they from the ground up. They're using existing um, chassis uh, in one way or another and modifying certain aspects that are the new design feature, new technology. We work with several startups that are tech technology based where their their software is proprietary. That's that's really the juggernaut, not the package, not the hardware that comes in. So they're using uh, it makes sense not only economically, but they're not having to tool up and create a new um, box that just holds all of their electronics into it. They're using something that's readily available off the shelf, customizing it some way with color, with graphics, uh, maybe with one additional part, but it's it's a minimal. Um, and, and that way they have a, an economically um, competitive product. Um, they don't have thousands invested in tooling and it takes them years just to get back to, to break even. They're ready to go from the start. And so that's exciting and we can push people in, in that direction as, we're, as, we're, as they're wanting answers as to how to go to mass manufacturing because they're, they're, the people are always wanting connections. It's, well, how do, I, how do I get on Shark Tank and then how do I make you know, thousands and thousands of these? So we had, we've had a couple of products on Shark Tank, and so that's interesting to see those and refrigerators that we've made end up at Lowe's and Home Depot you know, a year or two down the road. So um, that part is, is very important for us, but we can also, we have a role in, in um, educating and, and pointing people in the, in the direction that makes the most sense for the, for the circular economy. So glad to have been um, brought into this group by Sylvia. It's been exciting to, to meet everyone else. So appreciate it. Well, you already know kind of what I'm about, and I could probably get up and leave right now and hope that we're all safe buildings. But the real problem that, that we face with it is, is having enough reason to do it and understanding why we need to do it. And there's a very large community, uh, without, without bashing the development community right off the bat, there's a very large community out there that profits off of new buildings. You all know that somewhere between 40 and 50 percent of our economy from time to time is in housing starts and new construction that's huge that's that's none of us would have a job in some way if that weren't true so we can't just um, divest ourselves of the world the way it is in some ways but what i would like to impress on you are is the, the, the available data about existing buildings that show how much value there is already in them value already expended on the one hand, and particularly energy value, because this has become the strongest argument for saving those buildings, whether they're the 4,000 houses abandoned in Muncie in the last 10 years, or in Indianapolis, or any other Rust Belt city. Um, the ultimate strategy is to try to protect and save the things that we've already expended all this money and energy, money, energy on. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about preserving of buildings as a sustainable practice, and we'll talk a little bit about the greenest building and what that means. Um, and, and, the and the built environment in terms of a concept known as environmental debt, the, the notion that everything that gets built incurs an environmental debt, a, a very serious, deeply rooted environmental debt. Yeah. And, and then something that not very many people talk about, I certainly didn't invent this, but it's a notion called cultural performance, which is what happens when we convert the things that we've already invested in that have value in memory and tradition and uh, uh, over generations. Um, what happens when we protect and save those things and keep them around? What happens is something called cultural performance, ways they pay us back that aren't things that are allied necessarily to the profit instinct. Okay. Um, so um, I started thinking about this, I, I told you a little bit about this, because 
I was concerned about the green building industry, well, in one way, taking the moral high ground away from historic preservation. Um, that I could stand if I thought that it was doing something that was useful. Um, and I don't want to bash it entirely, but I have to say that the green building industry has missed the boat significantly because they have, they have paid almost no attention to the restoration or rehabilitation of the existing built environment. Building fabric is what we're really talking about. We're also talking about infrastructure, we're talking about tables, we're talking about light fixtures, all the rest of it. The green building industry essentially thrives off the notion that we have to replace everything that we have with something that's more energy efficient. That's the basic premise of it. Well, that's clearly not going to work when, a hunt, when there are 100 to 1 more existing buildings than there are new buildings. You're not going to wipe out the entire built environment to build a more efficient one. So, not to mention the cost of the time of payback, which which is a cost in and of itself. How long does it take to recoup the new energy expended? These are all issues that involve the building industry. Um, and I thought, you know, okay, so let's just say that the green building industry wins. What are we going to do? Rebuild the entire five continents? You know, this reminds me of the 50s and 60s when the highways tore down every inner city in America just about, and, and it's taken us this long to even get that that was a huge mistake. <laughs> you know, so we don't want to do that again. And that's sort of what started me thinking about it. we don't have time. Like, we don't have time, and we certainly don't have the resources. Um, and, and then also I started looking at another thing that influenced me was looking at the literature as an academic and I looked at the green literature, and I thought, why aren't the historic preservation people writing this stuff? Well, guess what? They are, and they were. And so I started reading things about how long it takes to recover the carbon footprint of something that's destroyed. A new building that's efficient, 35 to 50 years to recover what you took down and replaced. And replaced. That's a long payback for most of us, at least half a lifetime. Um, so that concerned me, and also, carbon footprint issues, it, again, the, 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 the recovery time on new construction is huge. It takes a long time to, to regain the expense to the environment or, or pay back the environmental debt, as I like to say. Um, so those are all the sort, of, those are the sort of things that got me interesting. So what is it about the greenest building? Preservationists have frequently said, always said, I guess, as the concept came up, the greenest building is the one that's already been built. This is true for the building that is still out, that is out of use. It's true for the building that is in full use. And the, and the notion is essentially based on the fact that we've already expended the energy, the cost, the human labor, the design, the thinking, and the living in whatever we did, whether as a worker or a mother or a father or, or, or whatever, that all of that is, is energy, human energy in some way that we can't afford to squander by just saying we don't need this anymore. Um, so that's that's so the already built building has value just because of all those sort of human values. Buildings are also quite easy to recycle. I don't mean tear down and part out, although that is an option sometimes. But really recycle in terms of use. There's there are very few buildings that can't be reused. Huh? And I, I could show you slides of buildings that were virtually on the ground that I've restored and at way less cost than it would have cost to rebuild that building from the ground up new. Um, the most important part of, of the argument, though, is, is what kind of energy is embodied in these buildings that we can't afford to lose or throw away? And this is kind of the landfill concept, like, okay, you can't just keep filling up the landfills. In Bloomington, Indiana, where I live, we had to abandon our landfill after spending millions and millions of dollars just to clean, up, clean it up, and it's still leaking. You know, and it's leaking into potable water sources, so we had to build a new reservoir. Um, you get it. You've heard the story. Um, there are tangible ways um, that buildings contain energy value. Uh, the labor expended, the materials bought, the resources mined. Uh, and there are also a lot of intangible ones, which have more to do with the notion of, um, of uh, converting values or, or looking at um, looking at new values that emerge from saving things. And this is the sort of way to, to leverage things like community character, for instance. This has always been a big argument for preservation. Quality of life is pretty obvious. 
um, uh, historical memory, uh, an enhanced sense of place. There's lots of literature on place and how important that is in our daily lives. And also contributions to social equity. And this is this is this can be seen in things uh, like the reclamation of housing districts, where the people who live in the houses are put back to work and then own those houses as a response to their work. So that there, are, these are strategies that that that, that reclaiming the built environment um, can. Um, can be used for to create new value or to reinforce the kinds of values that go beyond just the profit instinct. Um, let me explain a little bit about how environmental debt works because it's it's really pretty simple. Uh, you can convert the value of a building per square foot to energy values. So you can you can say you can calculate how many BTUs per square foot are in an industrial building. Okay? And basically, and, they, and depending on the, how sophisticated the building is, uh, let's say a hospital, it has a much higher BTU per square foot, which is energy expended per square foot to build, than let's say a warehouse does. Um, industrial buildings are more at the warehouse end. They're fairly inexpensive to build in terms of their energy footprint. Nevertheless, the figures are very high when you see what they really are. Um, this is what we, we refer to as embodied energy in buildings. There's embodied energy in this table, there's embodied energy in this jacket, and so on. All the things it costs to, to make that thing happen. When you throw that table away, you throw all that out the window, including the value of the people who were used to manufacture. Um, so this notion of environmental debt can be, can be directly transferred to buildings by type, so we can actually talk about what that energy sacrifice would be. Uh, I did a little research on a couple of, there's a very interesting community in Bloomington in, in an area that's now called the Levee, or what traditionally was called the Levee, now it's called West Downtown, which is a, you know, the effect of gentrified talk. Um, but essentially there were two very big industrial buildings there that had been abandoned. And the entire part of town was, you know, that was the other side of the tracks. If you lived on that side of the tracks, um, you weren't really considered part of the population. And if you lived on the university side of the tracks, you were. Anyway, uh, we had a mayor who decided that she wanted to revive one of those factories at City Hall. And, and she started that in motion. And over a period of years, that happened. And, and I was instrumental in, in reviving another factory there. Um, and, and, and reinventing a use for it. And so I did a study, and I went and saw this, and I gave this presentation to the Sustainability Commission in, in Bloomington. Um, I did a study that just evaluated the energy footprint of these buildings abandoned. Okay, one is a 32,000 square foot building, one is a 350,000 square foot building. So very quickly, in kilowatt hours, that the 32,000, um, foot building was worth a million dollars worth of kilowatt hours, standing empty. Okay, that's a lot of electric, you know, you work out. Um, or $600,000 in today's price for gasoline. So that building, either way, is, you know, a half a million to a million dollars in value sitting empty. Tearing it down, another $400,000. Environmental cleanup, another $200,000. Landfill costs, you get the picture. You've thrown away about a three or four million dollar building. We restored it for three. Put it back into full use for three, including cleanup. The, the 350,000 square foot building uh, was worth $12 million in kilowatt hours and $7 million in gasoline. So um, that building was restored for $11 million. That's, that's critical stuff. And that those numbers obviously go down for a two-bedroom house, but they're still important numbers, and a whole subdivision of two-bedroom houses, you can understand. You can understand the cost of it originally and also the loss. Thirdly, how does this culturally perform? What happened in this community was the restoration of these two buildings leveraged the restoration of dozens of other buildings, some historic, some not. Also leveraged millions of dollars worth of new construction, student apartments, condos, uh, low-cost housing, senior housing, brought several buildings by use back into use into different uses, restaurants, tire centers, and so on and so on. 
built a cultural trail, created a farmer's market, um, uh, drew public art and sculpture, yeah, became, created festival places, all these things which are the kind of human capital that we've been talking about. That's what I mean by the ultimate performance, which is the cultural performance of saving buildings. Thanks. in Indiana, the first goal was to uh, pass a bill that would allow us to grow it. Uh, we did that in 2014, uh, and since then, uh, my team has facilitated the research projects um, that have been uh, that have been held at Purdue University, which is our largest agriculture university um, and land grant university in the state. Um, they planted hemp for the first time legally this year. It was a little under two acres and, um, you know, they had some struggles, but they gained some really informative data um, that we're going to use and the project will expand next year. Um, we have had a lot of success with that. Um, the, one thing that we focus on at my association is inspiring um, others, no matter who they are, from people at the state house to the cities to the business people, inspire them to want to use him. Um, this new materials revolution is fantastic, and I love the idea of it with him, Kanaf, um, those things, but getting um, people, the, the designers, the manufacturers to want to use these materials is the struggle, I think. And that's what I feel like my job is, is to, um, to try to sell people on the idea of these materials from either the standpoint of um, the historic standpoint um, that we used to grow this in the U.S. and now we don't um, when you're considering hemp. Um, this area in the Midwest, Kentucky, Indiana, Illinois, um, th this was the hub of where the hemp was, was grown prior to the 1930s. And that has just, I mean, that just doesn't, that hasn't happened for a long time, but it could. Um, wherever corn grows best, hemp grows. Um, and so I try to push that idea to these people and, and play off of the history that we have. Um, but. Yeah, I, I think the, the hurdle here is to try to sell the idea of, of this. Um, and I could go about it in the way of sustainability, where it is ideal, an ideal input for the circular economy for so many reasons, from um, environmental impact to, um, to the remediation um, qualities and the sequestering of the carbon, and I could talk about that, um, but in, in Indiana, I tend to focus on the economic development um, because people tend to respond to that a little bit better. So that's what we are focused on now. Um, my, um, <coughs> I think the best point that I can make in regards to the circular economy or um, to whoever I'm, I'm trying to explain the situation to is that uh, the U.S. is the largest importer of hemp in the world. Uh, we get all of our textiles from China and we all of the seed from Canada. Um, right now, Canada can't meet the demand for organic um, seed for the U.S. Um, the, what we use to make the protein powder that you can find in Whole Foods, the organic grocery stores, um, that market is growing exponentially. Um, and we've seen that. And Canada cannot meet those demands, but yet the U.S. cannot grow what we are seeing as, as a market. I mean, we can't grow the hemp for this market. Um, so that, I think, is the, the biggest factor in that we this is an injustice to us and to our farmers who, these farmers would love a rotation crop um, alongside corn, their corn, or the organic farmers extremely interested in growing it, yet all this red tape that we have around it where the only people in Indiana who can grow it are researchers at this point. Um, that's, that's just not fair when we could be really utilizing this resource um, economically, environmentally. So that's, that's my standpoint. <laughs>
Thank you very much. Uh, unfortunately, we're running out of time. Uh, but please join us for the Q&A session on the Disruptive Innovation Festival on November 13th. Again, we'll send you all the details. Um, also, let's uh, continue this conversation. So maybe you can host us, uh, uh, yeah. Kelly, um, for, for you know, a longer or deeper conversation uh, about the circular economy and the achievements that we have and we're going to have uh, in the Midwest. Uh, and let's go to lunch. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you.